First, I'll put the microphone on. Then I will call this meeting to order. Good morning, everybody. I want to just start by thanking all of our witnesses today for appearing today to discuss controlling federal legacy IT costs and crafting 21st century IT management solutions. I also want to thank Ranking Member Paul and his staff for working with us on this hearing and for our continued partnership to address wasteful spending and government inefficiencies. Even though Ranking Member Paul is unable to join us this morning, I look forward to addressing the threats posed by the federal government's failure to maintain a modern and agile information technology infrastructure. Today is the first of multiple hearings on federal legacy IT systems. By shining a light on this important issue, I hope that agencies will work to reduce their reliance on costly legacy IT systems in partnership with Congress, the Biden administration, and industry stakeholders. Today's hearing will focus on identifying the costs and consequences of legacy IT, as well as the institutional barriers to modernization. According to the Office of Management and Budget, and Government Accountability Office, in fiscal year 2020, the federal government spent nearly $90 billion on IT investments and operations. Based on analysis of agency expenditures, legacy IT maintenance costs accounted for one-third, about $29 billion of that total spending. However, the actual cost is estimated to be much greater when we consider legacy IT's negative effects on security, delivery of services, and customer experience. To frame our discussion, we should have a common definition of legacy IT. The term legacy IT describes the federal government's use of old technology or custom systems designed to support insular agency operations. That is, legacy IT includes technology and systems that are no longer supported by industry vendors, as well as those that require additional maintenance or specialized knowledge to operate. We have seen the consequence of relying on legacy IT systems. For example, in 2014, hackers stole the personal information of more than 20 million people from the Office of Personnel Management because they were able to breach OPM's vulnerable legacy IT systems that lacked encryption. Despite this breach that was clearly linked to a failure to modernize, OPM still relies on a 34-year-old legacy IT system that costs $45 million annually, one, roughly one-third of OPM's annual IT budget, even though a modern system would only cost $10 million and produce $16 million in cost savings. At the Internal Revenue Service, the system used to annually process millions of tax documents is more than 50 years old and relies on a programming language called the Common Business Oriented Language, or COBOL, which was invented in 1959. In 2018, implementation of the 2017 tax law hit a major roadblock due to a shortage of staff with the specialized knowledge needed to update COBOL-based tax processing systems. IRS estimates that it costs $15.9 million annually to operate this system, and 60% of those costs are for labor alone. During the COVID-19 pandemic, IRS faced additional challenges because many of its aging systems rely on paper rather than digital records, paper that was inaccessible to IRS employees who were working remotely. And as a result, the American people felt the burden of delayed tax returns and economic stimulus payments. Similarly, in 2016, the Social Security Administration was forced to rehire retirees to maintain the COBOL system used for making payments to beneficiaries and their dependents. These systems cost the Social Security Administration about $146 million annually to operate. However, the Social Security Administration estimates that it would only cost $25 million over five years to modernize the system, and that would significantly improve functionality and security, as well as eliminate the need for specialized programmers. This begs the question, what are agencies waiting for? What's holding them back from realizing significant cost savings, increasing security, and providing greater customer service delivery through reducing their reliance on legacy IT? 
In addition to the costs and consequences of relying on legacy IT systems, today's hearing will also discuss the institutional barriers that prevent agencies from moving forward with their modernization efforts. Our distinguished panel includes the Director of the Government Accountability's Office Information Technology and Cybersecurity Team, as well as three former federal agency chief information officers who navigated the challenging IT modernization landscape and successfully moved their agencies away from legacy IT systems. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses about how they achieve success by leveraging available resources and by being innovative. So now um, we're going to uh, move to the testimony of our witnesses, but before we do that, it is the practice of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee to swear in witnesses. So if you will all please stand, and we have one witness on, uh, who is remote, and raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear that the testimony you give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. Thank you. You may be seated. And now we're going to start uh, with uh, the testimony of each witness, and I'll introduce each witness, then they'll go forward with their testimony. So we're going to start with Kevin Walsh. Our first witness today, Mr. Kevin Walsh, is Director of the Cybersecurity and Information Technology Team at the Government Accountability Office. He led the team that identified the 10 federal legacy IT systems most in need of modernization. Mr. Walsh has 15 years of experience at GAO, where he has led reviews of Chief Information Officer authorities, management of legacy IT systems, and assessments of IT-related risks. Welcome, Mr. Walsh. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Chair Hassan, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting GAO to testify on this important issue. Generally, we envision legacy systems as archaic government computers stuffed in a basement with fluorescent lights dismally flickering above, or perhaps in the warehouse next to Indiana Jones' Ark of the Covenant. While we don't need Harrison Ford for any IT systems that I'm aware of, there are certainly government systems that are in desperate need of modernization. In our 2019 report on the topic, we asked agencies about their critical legacy systems that were most in need of modernization. In total, the agencies identified 65 systems, which were, on average, about 24 years old. These systems support some of the most critical functions in government, such as wartime readiness, student loans, the operation of dams and power plants, tax processing, and Social Security payments. We took a deeper dive into the 65 systems and flagged the 10 systems that we thought were the most vulnerable and in need of modernization. Some were operating with known vulnerabilities or were written in over older code, such as COBOL, or assembly languages, and others had hardware or software that was no longer supported by the vendor. As the recent hacks of the software supply chains demonstrate, we have no shortage of bad actors in the world taking, willing to take advantage of vulnerabilities like these. We also asked the agencies that owned these 10 systems some very basic questions. Do you have a modernization plan? Does your plan include timeframes, a description of the work, and a plan to turn off the older system. Disappointingly, only the systems at the Department of Defense and Interior had these things in place. Further, there were no modernization plans for the systems at education, HHS, and transportation. To be fair, the hardware these systems ran on wasn't as old as their software. The hardware averaged a bit over seven years old. However, to put that in context, Amazon made news early last year when it extended the useful life of its servers from three to four years. In general, as our servers get older and our systems with them, they cost more to secure, more to maintain, don't always meet mission needs, and in some cases, the only people who can update them are retired. Basically, we're balancing cost, staffing, security, and functionality. To keep the lights on and systems running, we're accepting risks that, in hindsight, may not make sense. For example, as the chair noted, OPM reported that some of its networks were too old to implement encryption a rather important security step. Looking forward, modernization decisions need to carefully consider the following. How risky it's going to be, including risks to security and privacy, the criticality of the system, the cost to modernize or maintain the current system, potential cost savings, whether mission needs are being met, and if additional functionality or performance can be gained. 
After considering all of that, there will undoubtedly inst be instances where modernization may not make sense. For example, NASA uses Fortran code to communicate with the Voyager space probes that we launched in 1977. We can't catch and upgrade that hardware. On the other hand, we also identified a system at the IRS that reported annual labor and operating costs of about $16 million. The IRS reported that it would cost a staggering $1.6 billion to upgrade that system. We've also noted that agencies may not have a complete picture of their legacy systems. OMB drafted guidance in 2016 that would have required agencies to identify, evaluate, and prioritize their IT investments to make modernization decisions. Sadly, that guidance was never finalized. So, until agencies are able to identify all of their legacy systems, assess them, and document their plans for modernization, they run the risk of wasting money on systems that aren't meeting mission needs or are likely putting the agencies at risk. This concludes my comments, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move to uh, Casey Coleman. Ms. Coleman is the Senior Vice President for Digital Transformation at Salesforce. In this role, she is responsible for developing strategies and solutions for government customers looking to modernize their IT systems. Prior to joining Salesforce, Ms. Coleman served as the Chief Information Officer at the General Services Administration, where she led several modernization initiatives, including the first agency-wide move to cloud-based email and collaboration platforms. She also led federal efforts to develop the FedRAMP standards for cloud services and cybersecurity. Welcome, Ms. Coleman. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Now it's on? Thank you. I apologize for that. Thank you, Chair Hassan, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak on today's important topic. It's very timely because we've been talking about modernizing federal IT for a long time, and it's been a priority, but the prospects for progress have been significantly improved with the emergence of modern cloud-based digital platforms. The world's largest banks, manufacturers, retailers, and healthcare companies are already transforming their operations and customer service by embracing the cloud. The federal government can do the same. All of us engage with the government through interactions like paying taxes, adhering to regulations and laws, and receiving benefits and services. And IT has become the critical enabler to carry out vital missions of the government, such as defending the nation, providing economic stability, and improving public health. It is in all of our best interests that government and its IT systems work well. But too often, legacy IT is not an enabler, but a concrete barricade, making the experience for employees and customers fragmented, opaque, and confusing. When I first came into government, I was surprised to see how our systems didn't work for us, we worked for them. I couldn't believe how the technology slowed us down and frustrated our efforts to collaborate. These are commonplace issues, and they don't really inspire trust or confidence. And meanwhile, in our personal lives as consumers and customers, everything is online and mobile, personalized, accessible anytime. We expect the same of government, but this creates a growing gap between what we expect and what is being delivered. And the COVID pandemic really highlighted this growing gap. This was a cr crucial moment of need, and the organizations that delivered successfully public sector and private, were those that moved to the cloud so their employees could work from anywhere and deliver services online. We saw years of modernization compressed into a few months, from telehealth services to payroll protection loans, employee wellness checks, and contact tracing. These programs weren't on anyone's radar before the pandemic, so what made the difference? Moving to the cloud with access to rapid innovation and secure online services from the commercial platforms already serving the world's largest companies. Why does this matter? For a farmer, they can get their crops in the ground by not getting off the tractor and going into town to get their crop loan, but rather by doing it through a mobile app on their phone, not wasting time. For a veteran, seeing their doctor by video means they continue to receive the treatment they need and the benefits they've earned. 
And this pivot is important for government employees as well. No one comes into the government to step backward in time and do things the old way with brittle tools that were state of the art decades ago. They want to serve a mission and make a difference. If we want to recruit and retain talented public servants who have a, a choice, we have to give them tools to empower them and make their work effective. I'm especially passionate about this because I've seen it firsthand. As the CIO for GSA through much of the Bush and Obama administrations, I had the privilege of leading a multi-year modernization program to move GSA to the cloud and improve service delivery. When the Obama administration announced the cloud first policy, we led the way. Becoming the first to move the entire agency to cloud platforms for email collaboration and productivity tools. Our previous system was on really old hardware. We didn't know when it went down. I used to send myself emails at nights and weekends just to make sure it was still working. By moving to the cloud, we had all our tools available anytime, anywhere. And when weather emergencies like Superstorm Sandy shut down all federal offices, GSA kept going, working remotely as they have through the pandemic. In closing, modern cloud platforms are a complete game changer for improving government service delivery and mission execution. I don't mean to suggest this is a silver bullet, and I've included recommendations in my written testimony for other reforms. But all of these factors only click when you add the cloud. Thank you, and I look forward to questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Coleman. Uh, we're now going to turn to the witness who is joining us remotely, um, Ms. Renee Wynn. So welcome, Ms. Wynn. Uh, from 2015 to 2020, Ms. Wynn was the Chief Information Officer for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, otherwise known as NASA. She retired from NASA last April following a 29-year career in federal service that included nine years spent in federal information technology. During her time at NASA, Ms. Wynn was a critical and creative leader in the formulation and implementation of the Modernizing Government Technology Act, and she worked on several projects to reduce the agency's reliance on legacy IT systems. She now operates her own consulting firm. Welcome, Ms. Wynn. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Good morning, Chair Hassan and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am honored to be here to testify today on the importance of IT modernization. Now is an ideal time for departments and agencies to focus on large complex IT modernization projects. Many lessons have been learned about remote working and delivering federal services during COVID pandemic. These lessons can be used to accelerate modernization efforts. This combined with having the right personnel, processes and budgets significantly increase the probability that such projects will be successful. As the former Chief Information Officer of NASA and the Acting CIO and Deputy CIO of the Environmental Protection Agency, I have had ample opportunity to understand the dynamics inherent in modernizing IT. These experiences gave me the best view of the biggest challenges CIO faces when modernizing IT, an agency's culture, or sometimes referred to as the people challenge. A CIO must have sustained support and funding for IT modernization from the agency heads, including her executive team. She must have the right people with the right skills, and she must build and maintain relationships across the agency and with the contractor community. Without this, complex IT projects will fail. When I was offered a position at NASA, I was over the moon with the excitement at be becoming a member of this iconic federal agency. I was confident that I would find best in class IT management and cybersecurity practices. What I found was a work in progress, a need for more centralized or enterprise wide IT services, systems in need of modernization, a poor cybersecurity posture, and a culture that viewed the NASA CIO with skepticism. Fortunately, NASA recognized this as well and had already completed a Business Services Assessment, BSA. The BSA was undertaken to identify organizational and management improvement areas for NASA's mission support services, including IT. Based on the BSA recommendations, the CIO office developed and executed an implementation plan. Many valuable lessons were learned and a big issue was identified which was preventing NASA from gaining the full benefit of the BSA. 
Too much of NASA's IT budget and staff were not managed by the NASA CIO, making it difficult to modernize IT and control spending. Given this, NASA took the bold and politically charged step of having all the people and budget associated with a mission support function report to the head of that function. As I led the BSA implementation, the culture or people challenges were a constant. While NASA's top executives provided steadfast report, the executives and staff below them were resistant and at times difficult. Nothing rattles a civil servant more than having portions of their budgets and staff reallocated. Congress has taken the steps to address IT management and cybersecurity risks through legislation, from the Klinger Cohen Act to the Federal Information Security Modernization Act and on to the Federal Information Technology Acquisition and Reform Act. All were designed to advance IT in support of government services and provide improved information security. Support continued with the passage of the Modernizing Government Technology Act. This provided financial resources to agencies through the creation of a centralized modernization fund called the Technology Modernization Fund, or TMF. The oversight of Congress has also been a driving factor in making the intended improvements to IT modernization and cybersecurity. Legislative actions combined with sustained oversight have provided the foundation to improve IT management and cybersecurity. I will conclude today by emphasizing Congress should continue to hold oversight hearings and provide predictable funding and be prepared to act should gaps emerge in the federal government's ability to deliver more modern and effective public services. The CIO must have sustained support and budgets plus a knowledgeable and skilled workforce to meet the growing demands of IT modernization and cybersecurity. With this, the CIO can lead agencies forward to deliver IT modernization and improve cybersecurity so departments and agencies can deliver the mission for the American public. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today, and I stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Wynn. And now let's turn to our last witness, um, Mr. Max Everett. Mr. Everett served as Chief Information Officer at the Department of Energy following a career in IT security and risk management. During his time at Energy, Mr. Everett secured one of the first awards from the Technology Modernization Fund to migrate Energy's legacy email system to a cloud platform. He is now CEO of Adnovem Consulting Group, which works with public and private customers to provide services and promotes a lean and agile approach to IT modernization. Welcome, Mr. Everett. You're now recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Hassan, uh, Ranking Member Paul, and members of the committee. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and talk about this. I appreciate the advocacy um, that you all are providing and the support to all the CIOs who are currently having to go through the challenges of this. And so I'd like to talk for a few minutes after 20 years in federal, uh, in and around federal IT to talk a little candidly about uh, some of the challenges we've seen. Um, the events of the last year have obviously shown the critical importance of our IT and the challenges of legacy, uh, whether that was supporting people impacted by COVID um, or some of the recent cybersecurity incidents that we're still grappling with. Um, I would begin here suggesting, um, as a few people have talked about, that it's important to talk about what constitutes legacy IT. Um, and I think it's a broad definition. It's not merely the electronic systems. Um, fax machines are probably the most common legacy IT in the US government. Um, there is so much that is on paper right now that I think is a huge problem. Um, and it's preventing us from serving our customers, citizens. Um, I think this is important because the way that we value our electronic systems and IT is primarily data. Data is what we use to measure. We understand how we're doing. We're providing value with data. And when that data is locked into paper in warehouses, and I've been to a few of those warehouses that we own as a federal government, um, that is data and value that is locked away from us to use. Um, as, as When I was CIO at the Department of Energy, we spent a good amount of time, and it just started on the front end, of moving to digitizing documents. Right? And that was both to provide better service, but it was also to free up some of that value of data. Um, that data could help us drive our management better. It could help us serve better. Again, not only citizens, but everyone doing the mission in the department. 
And that's really what we're supposed to be there for. Um, I want to really quickly talk, and people have already hit, I think, on these two subjects. Most of the time in IT, we talk about people and we talk about process. Um, Renee already, I think, mentioned very well some of the people problem uh, that we have in government. Um, I can tell you that our human capital system needs dramatic improvement. Um, we simply cannot compete. Uh, we cannot even get access to some of the people that we need to recruit in government if we're going to move to the cloud, um, if we're going to move to managed services. Those are new skill sets. And there is a place for retraining our employees, uh, but right now we're not doing that very well either. Uh, and so I think it's important to continue to look at that issue of human capital. I can tell you as a CIO, I had a number of authorities on paper to be able to go and hire new people to use uh, more creative ways of hiring. It was rare that I was ever able to use those. Uh, I would walk into meetings with people having printed out documents from the OPM website stating my authorities to be able to hire and yet was unable to use them. Um, that, that is a critical failure that has to change. And it's, it's a communication issue and it's an oversight issue. Um, I do also want to very quickly mention um, uh, with gratitude that I know Congress recently allocated more money for the U.S. Digital Service and other groups. Um, I think that's important. Um, the U.S. Digital Service is an opportunity to bring in some very experienced people um, from digital backgrounds who want to serve uh, the United States government, and that's great. Uh, my encouragement for them is that they focus on sustainable commercial solutions. Um, those are the things that will last. Those are the things that, uh, you know, the current CIOs are actually going to be able to sustain with the workforce that we've got. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, I also want to quickly mention contractors. Uh, we cannot discuss the people issue in government without talking about contractors. Uh, in most departments, the number of contractors in IT typically outnumbers the feds by three or four to one or more. And we need to understand that if we're going to deal with that problem. Uh, I very quickly then want to just uh, jump into a couple things that I know we'll talk about further. We have already mentioned TMF. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of TMF. Um, TMF is not just about the money, although we certainly appreciate the billion dollars that have gone to TMF that will radically change that program. Um, it's about the process of actually getting those grants, what you have to go through. It changes the way that we should be managing IT and government. Um, and so I think TMF is important. Um, I can't let the opportunity pass without mentioning. Um, I know that there's been some conversations about uh, waiving um, the, the repayment. Um, I, I would encourage that to be given some thought. I'm supportive of it as long as the process is followed. The TMF process is just as important as the money because it means we're counting our costs, we're looking for savings, and we're managing things in the way we would expect anybody to manage our own money. And so I think that's critically important in all those conversations. Um, and to make sure that the TMF money that's gone over goes to the TMF process, that it goes through the committee and the board that is there and it goes through proper oversight. I think that's critical. Um, and with that, I'll conclude my remarks and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you to all of you for your excellent testimony. Uh, we're now going to go to rounds of questions from members of the subcommittee. I'll start, uh, and each round will be uh, seven minutes. And uh, do try to be mindful if a senator's trying to move to other witnesses as you give your answers, please. Um, why don't I start uh, with a question to Mr. Walsh? I'd like to start by identifying the costs and consequences of relying on legacy IT. We've established what we mean by legacy IT, namely systems no longer supported by industry vendors or custom systems that are difficult to manage and adapt over time. However, what is more difficult to define are the costs, both quantitative and qualitative, that continued reliance on legacy IT produces. Mr. Walsh, how does GAO determine costs associated with legacy systems? And how can agencies improve their identification and reporting of these costs? Identifying costs associated with legacy systems is more difficult than one might think. Uh, as, as Mr. Everett noted, uh, the, the fax machines don't show up on a spreadsheet. They're hard to, to figure out. You can look at our inventory of IT systems, but we just finished getting a complete inventory of our software licenses for each of the major CFO Act agencies this past year. So we still need to work on getting better inventories of what IT we have out there before we can fully capture the cost. Uh, there is a, a, a nascent effort underway called uh, Technology Business Management, TBM, 
which would closely tie accounting systems to our IT oversight and management systems, which would help allow us to better track where the money is going. Mm -hmm. uh, but to answer your question, there is no good way right now to identify all of the legacy IT in government. I want to follow up with that because, as I mentioned in my opening statement, roughly one-third of total federal spending on IT went toward legacy systems in 2020. But many experts believe that that number doesn't capture the whole picture. So, Mr. Walsh, what are we leaving out of our calculations on legacy IT costs? How can we better factor in qualitative or performance costs associated with legacy IT systems? So one of the biggest issues with, with the, the dollar amount is the $90 billion that this is all predicated upon is dramatically understated. Uh, that $90 billion does not include weapon systems or satellites or supercomputers. There's a lot of IT in the government that one might think, hey, that's, that's certainly IT, that actually is not included in that number. So getting all of that IT accounted for is, is the first big step. Once it is accounted for, uh, having that accounting system tie in to our technology management would, would help us get better to see if the money is going for specific hardware or software usages. But this is, this is not a, a silver bullet easy fix. This is going to take time. Well, thank you, and I, I will follow up with you on that probably in another, quest, another round of questions. But let me move on to Ms. Coleman right now. The American people pay the price of failing to modernize legacy IT systems. The United States government ranks among the lowest industries in customer satisfaction. Over the past year in particular, my office has received hundreds of messages from constituents struggling to access passports and visas, unemployment benefits, economic stimulus payments, benefits information from the Department of Veterans Affairs, and information on filing taxes. We've also heard from federal employees like those at the National Passport Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, who want to respond to the needs of the American people but simply can't do it because of their limited IT capabilities. Much of this is due to the antiquated paper-based systems that cannot support 21st century agency missions or respond to changing requirements during a pandemic. Ms. Coleman, how important is it for agencies to recognize that failing to modernize means failing to serve the American people? Uh, thank you, Chair Hassan. I think, I think it's a vital issue because, as you point out, we interact with the government on really critical services that we count on. And if those services aren't delivered effectively, there's, there's a cost. There's a cost in terms of employee productivity and in terms of our time as citizens and as the public. And there's also a public trust at stake. There's a, a, a confidence in the ability of government to deliver what we are anticipating as taxpayers and as citizens. So I think that public trust is one of the key costs. Um, and I, I think that it starts from the way government has been designed and operated. Our systems reflect the way the government is set up, sort of from the inside out, yeah. with the um, programs designed around different siloed functions. And as, as we interact with government, we don't think that way, but we're forced to navigate the complexity of that bureaucracy. So I think one, one, one criteria to change this is to start to think from the outside in, from the point of view of the customer or the, the resident that's uh, navigating that process. And there's, there, there are uh, very encouraging success stories. Uh, for example, the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture has uh, created Farmers.gov, which is a portal right. for all services delivered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So you don't have to navigate separate programs for crop loans or disaster insurance or conservation research. All of these things have been integrated and delivered in a holistic way. Thank it you. offers an example for others to be mindful of. Thank you. Um, let me just follow up. Mr. Walsh, can you describe agency efforts to prioritize customer experience through IT modernization? Um, Ms. Coleman just mentioned one at the Department of Agriculture, but I think the Department of Education also comes to mind uh, as a leader that's used IT modernization to improve customer service and mission readiness. That is correct. Uh, the Department of Education has actually modernized all of its data centers. It is now almost entirely in the cloud, and to its credit, it is, it is moving to, to get away from legacy. That's not to say their modernization journey is done, but they are a, a, a leader in that area. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I think, get through one more question. 
Uh, some have argued, Mr. Walsh, that maintaining legacy systems, especially customer-built systems that rely on antiquated coding languages and lack connectivity to other agency systems, are insulated from cyber threats and do not need to be modernized because they pose little risk. So, Mr. Walsh, do you agree with this argument? And if not, what would be a better risk management strategy than simply maintaining legacy IT systems in perpetuity? So... Legacy systems represent a, a security risk. They are not good at meeting our mission needs. They cost more to maintain because a lot of times the people who can maintain them are retired or in some cases deceased, uh, and they increase our cost every year. I don't think that security through obscurity or, or just hoping that the bad guys don't know the system code is a good approach. Well, thank you. And Ms. Wynn and Mr. Everett, the agencies you've worked for both handle extremely sensitive information that may be stored on legacy systems. How did you balance the need for modernizing legacy IT systems with mitigating risks inherent to storing sensitive information? And why don't we start with you, Mr. Everett, and then uh, quickly on to Ms. Coleman. Well, I'll quickly say that that was an enormous challenge for us. Um, as, as Kevin already said, one of the issues you have with legacy systems is you can't put modern protections on. Multi-factor authentication, encryption, um, those systems, the secret of those systems is to even work today, they often have to have a number of these little enabling things we call system accounts or administrative accounts, right? When you're administrative account, you know that's exactly what a bad guy wants to use because once they have it, right. they can use it to access and do other things in your system. And so uh, that's one of the dirty secrets of those older legacy things they're not protected more because people don't know them. They're, in fact, enabled by a bunch of other things, and pretty soon it's a Rube Goldberg apparatus. And also, you know, and, and security is also about resilience, right? One of the reasons your constituents can't get on those is they fail all the time. Well, why? Because they're, you know, they're old, right. and they fall apart, and nobody knows how to fix them. And so that in and itself is a security risk because everyone, everything else in the system has to adapt around that, which causes you to make all sorts of other security compromises to keep it going. So, Thank you. And Ms. Coleman, just very quickly on that issue, and then we're going to move to other senators. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the, the point is well taken, and one of the key issues with securing data of any kind of sensitivity is good cyber hygiene. And uh, estimates are that well over 50% of all vulnerabilities are due to just basic good cyber hygiene. And with modern cloud platforms, you're really taking advantage of best in class security and a partner who can assist you with that. But really, ultimately, the government needs to start with basics and maintain good protocols. Thank you very much. I thank you all for your answers. Now we're going to turn uh, to other senators. And uh, first on up is Senator Rosen, who has been very patient and is very knowledgeable on this issue. Senator Rosen, you're recognized for seven minutes. Well, thank you, Chair Hassan, uh, for organizing this important meeting. Uh, Chair Hansen, you have done so much work on the issue of federal IT management. Uh, it's critically important to serving our taxpayers, to saving us money, to delivering services, as well as boosting the morale and effectiveness of our federal agency workers. I really appreciate uh, everything that you've done. And of course, a common theme that's emerged from all four of our witnesses is the importance of the federal workforce in implementing IT modernization at our federal agencies. I have to admit that I actually wrote COBOL legacy IT systems uh, in the 80s and the 90s, and so I intimately know exactly what you're talking about, and uh, uh, it makes me feel uh, a little old, but, uh, but we do need to move forward on this. So I've been working with my colleagues on this committee across the Senate to address the nation's shortage of these kinds of technical workers and cybersecurity workers and uh, federal public service positions, um, they really should be attractive to those folks who want to work in tech. So I've joined Chairman Peters and Senator Hoven in reintroducing the Federal Rotational Cyber Workforce Program Act, it's going to provide opportunities for our civilian cybersecurity employees to rotate among various federal agencies, expands their experience, expands their professional networks, and expands their opportunities to serve the country and just last week, I introduced a bipartisan bill with Senator Blackburn, Blackburn to allow DHS and DOD to establish a civilian cybersecurity reserve pilot program. It would call on former military and civilian cyber uh, uh, security employees and others uh, for temporary assignments in the government. So I think this can serve as a model for other agencies. 
So Mr. Walsh, uh, in the course of GAO's reporting on, on your IT modernization efforts, have you identified agencies that have done particularly well in recruiting or retaining these types of employees? How do we export those best practices? And, and if you haven't, um, does OMB and OPM play a role? And how, how do you see that role? So we have not done specific work, or, well, I, I should say I am not aware of specific work in that regard on hiring cyber employees. Now, I do know that, uh, as, as Mr. Everett mentioned earlier, the, the U.S. Digital Service, as well as 18F, serve as ways to get private sector talent into the government. I don't know if they're as, as quick as, as your proposed legislation is, is considering, uh, but having that, that venue for external talent come into the government and share ideas and propagate those ideas is very important. Uh, CIOs also do have additional authorities that they can use to hire and bring in folks from the outside, but Mr. Everett earlier identified uh, issues with executing some of those authorities. GAO has not done specific work in that regard, uh, but um, I'm eager to work with your, your uh, staff on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Wynn, in your testimony, uh, you mentioned there needs to be civil servants who are working on every federal IT project and that those workers need to be reskilled. So um, you said that early efforts to reskill existing federal employees have been successful. Can you kind of elaborate on what, re what type of reskilling was the most successful and what area we need to still reskill in so we might direct our efforts uh, in creating workforce um, uh, and training in that? Uh, for your uh, workforce pipeline. Great. Well, thank you for that one. So the Office of Management Budget through the Federal CIO Council, uh, through their workforce subcommittee, established a reskilling uh, institution or program with that. And what they did is they, uh, a lot of federal civil servants applied to this program. They took an aptitude test for cybersecurity. And from there, the top folks were taken, and yet we still had to cut the line at a low number because it was our first ever endeavor. And those folks went through some training programs, proved themselves to be very, very capable cybersecurity professionals, and then went on to seek future employment still within the federal government, but in this case, a job change. And so the bottom line is federal government workforce is talented when we show them the way and give them the time and the support to get reskilled, we can take their talent and use them in other places, especially in cybersecurity. Thank you. I look forward to working on that. I, I'd like to move on now. And again, Ms. Wynn, I want to talk to you about to IT modernization and its importance to national security. Um, given your background at the Department of Energy, which houses the uh, Nevada National Security Site, uh, located not, not too far from uh, Las Vegas, it's facilities that are critical to our security. Um, can you comment on why modernizing the federal government's IT and cybersecurity infrastructure is critical to uh, our national security and safety, particularly as it relates maybe even to our nuclear stockpile. How do we move forward, create more nimble, secure platforms and firewalls uh, to protect our national interests? Well, I think- Well, it's Senator Rosen, why don't I get started and then Max Everett might be able to perfect. add a few more things, things to this. That's and what first I'm going to him after you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I will get it started because critical infrastructure right now, the space, space and flying in space and satellites are being thought about as critical infrastructure because we rely on them for logistics. Moving anything around this globe requires satellite uh, navigation if you expect it to get there and avoid significant weather events. And that, and that type of security is very, very challenging. You need the cooperation of a number of parties, including those that all those that operate the infrastructure. You have the electric grid, you have the water infrastructure, in this instance, I mentioned space. And those folks have to get together and first and foremost recognize that there are real threats and they've actually proven themselves to be in these critical infrastructure. And in that case, work as a team to put into place and take steps towards securing it better. And at NASA, we were beginning to do that by taking a look at our critical satellites and then trying to figure out the best way to secure them in this current environment. And as noted previously, we can't bring back our older satellites and give them a new operating system, but we can do things here on terra firma, as I call it, 
to secure them better. And then we have to apply uh, good neighbor policies because we fly in the same place as other countries, as Department of Defense and um, private sector. And so again, working together to protect our critical infrastructure is what's needed to get the job done. Thank you, Mr. Everett. I know my time's up, but if you could be uh, kind of quick about it, that would be fantastic. And, and I'll just add that um, a, a number of members have conflicts and aren't going to be able to come. So, Senator, if you want to take a couple of more minutes and the witness. Oh, okay. Well, so, Mr. Everett, then, then please, uh, please elaborate. I, I will, and thank you. And you're right. Uh, Department of Energy, one of the great challenges of the department is the, the breadth of its mission. Um, uh, certainly, some of us know that they have a nuclear mission uh, for protecting, building, designing the nuclear stockpile. Uh, but that mission stretches all the way down to fundamental science that's conducted with science around the planet. Um, and we have what are called user facilities that are used with, by the top scientists around the world um, to do collaborative scientific basic research uh, that not only helps the United States, certainly, but really helps the entire planet. Um, it's almost, you know, one could argue it's almost a diplomatic role that we play in science because of that. And so with those very divergent missions, it adds an extra layer of challenge uh, when you're at the Department of Energy. Uh, I would say there are three sort of focus areas that we tried to work on that we think are the most important for that. One of them is simple visibility, uh, right? And visibility is about being able to see and understand, as we've talked about, what do you have? What actual systems do you have? What legacy systems do you have? Um, who's on your network? Um, that's a critical element. Um, and it's one we've not done very well as a federal government. Um, I think so, some of you are already aware and it's been discussed over the last few months with the cyber incidents we've had. There have been some significant challenges with the Einstein program um, that needs to really be very carefully relooked at. Um, and I would tell you in our own department, that was a challenge of, of basic reporting and visibility of what was going on across our whole footprint. Uh, the second part of that is risk management. And this was where we put a lot of our focus. Um, when you have a large enterprise like NASA, Department of Energy, GSA, or any um, and you've got divergent levels of risk, uh, we will never have enough resources. Uh, I'm always, when I was CIO, I was always glad to come and ask Congress for more money, uh, but you only have a certain amount of resources to go around. And so risk management is looking at what are your top risks, what are your most important things, and they get the first dollar. Um, and you find that balance. And so that's what risk management is, and it takes real thought and it takes effort, and you need to document and discuss and be able to defend your efforts. Um, and so we spent a significant amount of time because it's critically important. Um, the third element I would talk about, and it starts to go to what we're talking about here today with, with legacy and modernization, is uh, moving to new models, right? So some of you may have heard the term zero risk or zero trust networks. Um, fundamentally, you cannot do zero trust networks with legacy um, because they require some new tools to be able to better manage what's on your network and make sure that those things can essentially um, tell other things on the system that they're allowed to be there and do what they're doing. Um, that is very difficult to plug into a 20-year-old system. Um, so these newer models like that simply won't work in those legacy environments. They've got to be updated to do it. Um, another area I would mention here is FedRAMP. Um, FedRAMP has been around. It was started for a good purpose. Um, I still think it can serve a valuable purpose, uh, but I would tell you FedRAMP is far too slow. Um, I don't know of any vendor that I've talked to in my time as CIO or now um, who doesn't complain about the timeline for FedRAMP. Um, so what that means is probably FedRAMP needs some more resources uh, because what FedRAMP does is it does the baseline security work uh, one time, right? So it's a shared service. It's doing that one time for everybody so that you can then start to bring more innovative solutions to market more quickly in the federal government. We're missing out on opportunities um, you know, I recently talked to a venture capital person. He told me for some small and mid-sized companies with unique new services, primarily software as a service, that it was taking them, you know, four to five people and a million dollars in a year to go through FedRAMP. And for most of these small startups who are coming up with new innovative new things to do, that's not sustainable. Uh, and we're going to miss out on those opportunities if we can't uh, improve that process. Well, thank you. I'm not sure. I just have a closing statement, but I'm glad to ask other questions. But one thing I know for sure is that good code means speed. Good code means ease of use and data capture for the end user. Good code means the better the data capture for analytics for our future. So it saves us time. It saves us money. It improves outcomes and it helps us plan for the future. So by 
modernizing these systems, by having safe, secure systems, by capturing more data in consistent ways, we are able to predict, plan, and protect ourselves. And uh, we have to do that. So, Chair Hassan, I'm glad to continue to talk about this. I'm not sure if someone else is in the room, but uh, uh, you tell me. Well, uh, thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, I, I think right now it is just you and me, and I have another round of questions. But if you have a couple of more, why don't you go ahead, and then I can finish up with my round. You know what? I, I'm going to head over to SASC, uh, where I think I'm finally up over there. So uh, I appreciate everyone being here, appreciate what you do. Um, and I just uh, uh, sincerely hope that we can try to, I guess, even one system at a time, continue to get off those legacy systems onto something that's uh, newer, uh, more nimble, and allows us better data capture so we can continue to take care of everything that we need to. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So now I'll turn to a second round of questions, and uh, I appreciate the testimony you all have uh, provided so far. I'm going to start uh, with this question to Ms. Wynn. I've advocated for a biennial budgeting cycle where Congress would determine and appropriate the budget in one year, and then year two can be spent on doing effective oversight to inform future spending. The current one-year cycle often leads to hasty decision-making and neglects capital investments that take several years to implement, including IT modernization projects designed to move away from legacy IT systems. Ms. Wynn, how difficult is it to manage IT modernization around the one-year budgeting and appropriation cycle, and how did you work within this cycle to achieve your goals? What would you have done differently if there was a biennial budgeting process? Thank you for the <clears throat> Chair Hassan for the question. One of the things that I found first is sort of the annual appropriation, and that is the first time, first thing you need to know is every time you cross a fiscal year with a project, and most IT projects cross a fiscal year, you add more risk to your plan. And that is because from year to year, you face the potential loss of funding or the loss of people. So now you've disrupted your project and now you've most likely extended when you're going to get that project done. That extension, if it goes on too long, means you're potentially using software that will uh, no longer be considered modern or available or could reach end of life by the time you use or get that system back in operation after it's been modernized. What I would do is, uh, probably as most CIOs would do, is I'd take my total budget and i create a reserve. And that way, that reserve would be used to make sure that the most critical or the highest risk projects would get funding for sure going into the uh, secondary years of their project. And that way, I knew that they could be able to continue. And if I didn't do that, I'd run the risk of work stoppage and then I could lose the talent of my staff, of staff from other mission mission areas or mission support, or I could even lose contractor staff. And that would again, start to slow down and add more risk to your project. And if I had a second year added to it by a bi biannual, I would be able to take the projects and draw a timeline of people and dollars and make sure that they were spent according to it and hold people accountable to a two-year increment. This would reduce the risk in a complex IT project because you didn't have to worry about funding um, every few months because by the time you get appropriations finished and you get the new authority money several months in a fiscal year have gone by, you could actually plan about 18 months and be assured of those resources, therefore reducing the risk of just managing a complex IT project and increasing uh, the time at which you could, or not increasing the time, but you could deliver that project a lot faster because you would take out that funding um, issue or it would convert the funding issue to an 18 month issue instead of a nine month issue. And that would be hugely beneficial and a great gift to CIOs and program and project managers around the country. Thank you. Um, Ms. Coleman, at GSA, you work to develop FedRAMP and streamline agency IT acquisitions in coordination with industry partners. And you now work for one of those industry partners that's trying to help the federal government modernize its systems. What's the impact that the one-year budgeting and appropriation cycle has on industry and its ability to, to support IT modernization efforts? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I agree with everything that Renee said about the ability to plan over long time horizons. It's almost even not a nine month planning horizon with the annual cycle we have now because of the frequency of continuing resolutions which create even greater uncertainty right. about available funding and, and disruption of resources. So that, uh, that alone is, is a complication. Uh, one thing I'd like to suggest as a companion idea to a two-year uh, planning and, and budgeting cycle, which I think is a, a much needed and helpful measure, is uh, greater use of agile DevOps uh, tactics to break modernization projects into short sprints that deliver short and, and relatively quick intermediate results so that there can be fine-tuning and transparency and oversight throughout the process. Any project that is uh, intended to deliver results in two or three years is, is, is going to be out of date by the time results are delivered. So we need to be thinking about uh, very short, rapid cycles to, to deliver results and the accompanying uh, oversight and funding to go with it. Um, working capital funds of, of previous legislation have, have been very helpful. We use that with great success at GSA. We also implemented a zero-based budget so we could see where our incumbent costs were and understand where we needed to place our dollars for modernization priorities. Thank you. Well, that kind of brings me to uh, another set of questions, and I'm going to start with Mr. Walsh uh, concerning agency modernization plans. Currently, agencies are not required to develop or publish IT modernization plans. While many agencies have developed plans, some of these plans fail to establish concrete timelines, cost estimates, and goals. GAO recognizes that having an IT modernization plan in place is essential to reducing reliance on legacy IT systems. What makes these plans such a valuable tool, and how can agencies better leverage them to meet their goals and manage their resources? So having these plans is valuable just, just to get agencies thinking about it. In, right. in agencies that don't have a documented plan, we're not sure what kind of resources they're going to be able to throw out or what kind of time frames, even the scope of the project. So having some idea of what needs to be done is kind of the, the most fundamental step. And in, in our 2019 report, it was very disheartening to see that three of the agencies didn't have a plan. An additional five had some aspects of a plan, and only two really had a firm idea of what needed to be done. Uh, so so it's it's critical because modernizing legacy systems is critical to the government's security and, and right. privacy and how well we serve our citizens. So getting our, our agencies to be thinking about modernization is, is the first step. Well, I, thank you for that. One other key element that modernization plans, when they do exist, often omit is how the agency plans to manage costs arising from maintaining a le legacy system while they're also implementing a modern system. So let me turn to Mr. Everett now. In your time as a chief information officer at the Department of Energy, how did you manage the competing investment needs between existing systems and new systems? How might agencies leverage moderniz modernization plans and existing resources to offset what's essentially the cost of the overlap? Well, I, I would tell you much of my experience was, to be very frank, was robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, in, in most cases, to do those modernizations, um, you, you, are, you are going to have to take money from somewhere. Um, I think to Kevin's good point that you've already brought up, without a modernization plan, you can't have the planning. Uh, I was frankly somewhat fortunate as a CIO. We had some monies that were multi-year monies that gave some level of, of help to us in, in being able to plan. But I know many of my peers had only single-year money, um, which was a, a great challenge. Um, so I think your discussion of uh, biannual is certainly helpful. Um, the other one I would bring up certainly is things like TMF um, and, and within the MGT Act, the, the idea of working capital funds. Um, I know that there is long held concern about working capital funds turning into slush funds and things of that nature. Um, I, I think that simply means they need to have the appropriate oversight, right. but they would allow that level of longer term planning and making, listen, anybody can put out a modernization plan. But if they don't have the money to back it up or the people to execute on it, it's not going to work anyway. Um, I will also say I think what Ms. Coleman said is absolutely correct. Uh, Kevin could probably sit for hours and tell us stories of, of programs that have been run in the government for multiple years, these large projects, 
millions if not billions of dollars wasted that did not ever come to a finish line. Or even worse, came to a finish line, were probably even reported as being on time and schedule, and yet provided no actual value to citizens, to anyone. And so uh, breaking things up, that agile method of, of breaking things up and doing it in those smaller chunks is appropriate. There are very few systems that we should be building in government anyway. We should mostly be using commercial. And where we do need to build those, and, and certainly Energy, NASA, and other places have those use cases, um, they should be done in an agile way where you can have some oversight, make sure they're delivering value on an iterative basis yep. um, so that you don't have to plunge hundreds of millions of capital expense into something only to come to the end of the road and the money's all gone. Um, I think that's, that's happened far too often. Um, and so it was a challenge again for us. Um, we had a little more flexibility, but even I had to have um, a lot of conversations. Renee made the right point. You often simply had to build a reserve. And that reserve was usually coming from other things you would have liked to have done that were customer service oriented um, or those kind of things. And it's, and it's a real trap. And it builds what we call technical debt, right? right? And it's not just the monetary debt. It's all the things we can't do right. that are a part of that. Yeah. Well, I thank you for that. And I, I'm now going to take um, advantage of a rare moment uh, in, the, in the Senate when, um, because we've got a little bit more time and you guys are such an ex excellent panel, I have two or three more questions. So uh, bear with me, but uh, I think we're learning a lot here. And I want to turn now to the issue of the authority of chief information officers. So I want to start with a question to you, Ms. Wynn. The Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act expanded the responsibilities of agency chief information officers and requires their input on IT acquisitions to realize cost savings and to manage IT inventories. However, despite the good intentions of this law, GAO has found that chief information officers do not receive adequate deference on IT planning, budgeting, and management. Ms. Wynn, can you speak to your own experiences as a chief information officer, both at the Environmental Protection Agency and at NASA, and how you worked to get institutional buy-in from agency leaders to advance your IT modernization efforts? Chair Hassan, I would begin by saying never let a crisis go to waste. <laughs> Uh, when it came to exercising the authority and making culture changes and process changes within a federal agency. My first example comes um, in when I first arrived at NASA and noticed that we, as Max had earlier said, you need to know who and what is on your network. And that NASA did not have that uh, ability to look at the network associated used across the globe and that's relied upon for the NASA flying assets called satellites. And at that point, we were able to, I could easily go to the leadership and say, how do you know you don't have problems? How do you know you have problems? And so we began the process of rolling out the continuous diagnostic and mitigation program. And with that transparency, we got uh, with that visibility, we got to see what was on our network. And there was a lot of inappropriate software and activity on the network. And then I used that data to share with agency leadership to say, I don't think it's okay for us to be having this type of software on NASA's network. And from there, I would just build with this visibility that we got, tell stories back to folks and turn it around to say, this is not acceptable for a public agency and use the pride that my colleagues had about working for NASA to really propel us forward. And with each fiscal year, we got better at working as a team by gaining that visibility. And then what we did is when I mentioned the business services assessment and the also the follow on to the business services assessment when NASA said, Functional areas such as the CIO needed to have control over the appropriate IT budgets. This was also true for procurement. My colleague in the procurement office recognized that IT needed to be procured better and stood up an IT division while I was still there. And we worked very closely with her to set that up. And the establishment of that IT division meant that all IT purchases for NASA would have to go through that division and that I or my team had significant influence over that acquisition process. That took about 18 months to get set up. It got going in full 
uh, full swing there after I left NASA, but by having a crisis, by having visibility, and by forming partnerships, NASA was able to continually iterate in order to gain, give the greater authority over to CIO, gave um, IT procurement greater visibility into what NASA was buying. And with that visibility and with that partnership, um, each year that I was there at NASA, we were saving about $50 million a year just on software product, um, purchases alone. So real differences can be made through partnership. And I will close with the same thing I started Never let a good crisis go to waste and just stand in someone's office, make a friend and get going on fixing the crisis and changing the processes that might have created that crisis. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, there's, a, there's a lot for us to learn from that and from your experience and your good work. Um, chief information officers spend an average of two years or less in their position. So I'm concerned that this short tenure provides very little time for CIOs to be effective or establish fiscally responsible practices. Ms. Coleman, you spent 12 years at the General Services Administration. Do you think that your ability to stay with the agency for that long contributed to your success as a CIO, CIO and how so? Absolutely. It uh, allowed me to really understand the culture of the agency and uh, to the point Renee made to to build relationships and partnerships with uh, senior leaders because modernization is a team sport and it, it's important that CIOs have adequate authority, but it's also important that top leadership understand the role that they play in supporting transformation. And to the point you made earlier about the need for modernization plans, it should start at the top and be a priority even of the secretary or the administrator of the agency and, and the appoint, at the appoint, political appointee level. And so by having a, a long tenure at GSA and in the role of CIO, I was able to understand that and be able to um, use the tailwinds provided at GSA. It's an agency that uh, provides business services to other agencies, so they take pride in understanding technologies to be a good uh, supplier and partner with other agencies. And that gave us momentum with moving to the cloud because we were able to um, tap into the culture of what the agency is, is good at and the DNA to, to, uh, to support, support it across all, all lines of authority. And that alignment, not only with leadership, but also with my peer CXOs, the CFO, the head of HR, and so forth, gave us the unity of leadership to, to make real progress. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now turn to Mr. Everett because you had a slightly di different uh, experience at energy, because you had a brief tenure at the Department of Energy, but you were also able to be extremely effective. So what do you re recommend that current and future CIOs do to be most effective from their very first day and then forward at an agency? So I think there, there's some tremendous challenges on that, and, and part of this gets into the conversation of political versus career CIOs yep. um, that, you know, and there's, there's a trade-off. I absolutely agree the longevity is critical. Uh, because they can understand the mission. Um, you know, the, the political ones typically are going to have more access to senior leadership. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. Um, what I would tell you is we, um, part of the reason I was being able to be effective is I'd been in federal government before. I knew the ropes. I knew what I was getting into. Uh, I, I routinely tell people as just sort of a shorthand, it's going to take, if you're new to federal government, it's going to take you a year to know which way is up. Um, if you're coming, no matter how smart you are, private sector, you're going to have to go through a whole year just to know which way is up, all the differences that you have there. Um, and because of the nature of the timing, again, going back to budgets, because of the timing of budget, you're going to go two years before you're working with your own budget that you had any input into, right? When I walked in in 2017, my budget, my initial sort of budget formulation had already been submitted to OMB. By the time that goes clinking around through the entire process of OMB, back to the Hill, it was, you know, it's... October of, you know, a year and a half later. That's really challenging. I've talked to people from both parties who've been very involved in trying to recruit innovative leaders to come in as CIOs, and you will find ones, they're willing to give up the money. They'll divest their stock. They'll take a salary hit. They'll move their family. They're willing to serve our country. And then they find out, oh, it's going to be two years before you can actually make an impact. Yeah, uh, That's a killer because their, their whole reason of doing such a thing is to make an impact. And when you tell them, and if they're politically appointed, they know they have a shelf life. Yeah. And that's a really hard sale. It's made it really challenging. 
you know, we have great career folks as well that have done really good jobs as CIOs without question. Um, and so my emphasis is definitely there of giving them more authorities. Um, I would love to get some of those outside CIOs, regardless of political affiliation, yep. um, because thankfully IT is the last nonpartisan issue in town. Um, and so I'd love to have those people. I'd love to have those innovators. But we do have to have the structure so that they feel it's worth the sacrifice uh, to come in and, and bring that experience and the innovation that they have from the private sector. Um, it's critical. And in the meantime, we got plenty of great career CIOs and deputy CIOs out there. Um, and so giving them the tools, Vitara is an important tool, uh, but you have to know how to use it, right? Yep. You can't, uh, you know, I've been at probably the three most spread out agencies. I was DOE, yep. I spent time at Commerce and at DHS. Um, I would describe them at best as a feudal system, um, if not a mob family. And you have to be able to pick your fights. Um, and and I've, I've seen CIOs who got run over um, because they didn't use Fatara appropriately. Um, yep. Renee made a great point. Procurement was a great ally to me in the yep. process. Um, so I would tell people walking in, your procurement officer is going to be a great help. Um, I, I will pick a fight and say, we need more support versus the CFOs. Um, CFOs typically are Senate confirmed. Yeah. Only one CIO, VA is Senate confirmed. Um, and just in the, in the pecking order of this town, it is very difficult for CIOs going up against a Senate confirmed yep. CFO. And that's, um, you can make a great relationship with them, but at the end of the day, they're, they're higher on that pecking order. And that's a challenge for many CIOs because it's, you're not sort of quite at the same level and, and that's a challenge. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to one other topic before we, I, I ask you a wrap up question and it's something you, all of you have mentioned, uh, but I just want to focus in on it a little bit. So I want to start, uh, again with Mr. Everett. Um, as part of the American Rescue Plan, the Technology Modernization Fund received $1 billion to loan to agencies in order to modernize IT systems. Although we don't see the impact of these funds for years to come, this is a really major step forward to reduce reliance on legacy IT, and I hope that the fund prioritizes agency plans to replace the legacy IT systems that we've discussed today. So, Mr. Everett, as a CIO who successfully leveraged the Technology Modernization Fund to move away from legacy IT systems, how should agencies utilize the fund to ensure that they not only have the resources and infrastructure to support IT modernization, but also ensure that the systems they propose actually reduce reliance on legacy IT while contributing to better security and customer service? Uh, the first thing they should do is have the courage to actually go apply for those. Um, and I think if you go look, I believe it's still only five agencies have actually received TMF uh, okay. loans. Uh, so, and I spent a lot of time browbeating people, and I know of people who were, they were simply afraid of the oversight, afraid of the visibility. And they were also afraid of the repayment, uh, yep. which is why I think that has to be looked at. Um, but a lot of them, listen, from my team, the culture chain was important. Uh, I had members of my team, my career team, come back and tell me they enjoyed the process. They went through a process that's similar to anybody who's ever worked in private sector. You can go right now to the, the, the website, the TMF website, and go through the spreadsheets and see the level of detail that you were asked about your current cost basis and your future cost basis. That's how everybody in the private sector runs their IT. That's exactly how we should. We should know all of our costs across the board. We should be able to tell, project them out over years. That's what any mature organization would do. Um, and that's a huge value of the TMF. Um, and you need your people to do that. And so literally, I don't care if you don't turn it in, everyone should go do one of those today. Yeah. Uh, everybody in government. Um, so I think part of it is being brave enough to, to step forward and go ahead and do it. Um, know that there's going to be that challenge. Um, there is oversight to it. The board checks in on you so you don't just get a giant right. check. Um, there is a process to it, and that's critically important. Um, I would urge all of you, I've been in this town 20 years, um, when, when Congress gave a billion dollars to a program that most people kind of don't understand, I know for a fact in this town there are people eyeballing that money who want to cut the line and avoid the process. And I would strongly urge you to make sure that your oversight does not allow that to happen. That process has to be followed. Um, now, it can go to all sorts of things. And so to your point, um, those, those legacy systems are probably, arguably, the easiest ones to show, um, in many cases, where you can get value and return on the investment. Yep. And they're great, but I will also mention 
and this is where some of those waivers need to be looked at, there are so many customer facing systems, it's very hard to document the cost savings there. Um, the customer service we can talk about all day long, it's, it's, you can see with your eyes, um, but it may be harder to show the cost savings on that system. And that's where I think we do need to look at some, some ability to defer or waive costs as long as the process is followed. Um, uh, TMF, I, I'm such a proponent, as you can tell, of TMF, yeah. because that process leads us to how we should manage things. Um, it should not simply be giving things out to a most favored program. Right. Uh, we've done that too often, and that's a disaster. Um, making people go through the process is just so critical. And I think any CIO coming in right now, it's a great test of your team. Ask them to go find you. I would, I would challenge any new CIO. Yeah. Tell your team to find one program or system that needs to be modernized and make them fill the form out and take a look at it. And you should be able to tell right there, do they know their costs? Do they know their systems? Do they understand how to project that budget? And if they don't, get help. There's, listen, there's some great groups in town, um, some truly private sector associations that will come in free of charge and come help you with your acquisition and your budget process, and they're not trying to sell you anything. Yeah. Um, as well as uh, Kevin mentioned TBM, another great process you can go through to understand in a very modern way how, how your costs should be managed. There's help out there for anybody who's looking for it in federal government right now if they're willing to reach out. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to turn to Ms. Coleman, too, about working capital funds. I just will also note that one of the issues you raise is how we go about um, qualifying and quantifying customer service value, right? Um, because obviously for taxpayers, you know, our, our goal should be to make the interface with the federal government as customer friendly as possible um, since taxpayers are, are footing the bill here. And so um, trying to figure out a way to really assess value there, I think, is, is really important. Um, Ms. Coleman, working capital funds are another mechanism that agencies can use to support their IT modernization priorities outside of the one-year budgeting and appropriation cycle. While some agencies have the authority to establish these funds under the Modernizing Government Technology Act, some agencies weren't given the authority, which is a technical error that I hope to address in future legislation. But Ms. Coleman, the General Services Administration effectively uses working capital funds and fees generated from its government-wide services to fund its mission. Can you describe how GSA uses savings produced from modernization projects to keep the working capital fund going? Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the keys is to take a portfolio approach, and I, I completely agree with what Max said earlier about the, the working capital funds. And Modernization of any system by itself, viewed in isolation, is, is going to be, uh, it's going to incur cost and complexity. Uh, one way to um, counterbalance that is to look across all systems and all investments and to be able to do puts and takes in a portfolio-based approach. And if you have a working capital fund, you can apply, know your money, and you can time the modernization according to your risk management and according to your uh, most critical systems first, or the ones that deliver the greatest impact. And so as it pertains to customer service, uh, that is a qualitative measure, not so much a quantitative yeah. measure. But the ability to stay up to date with platforms that are maintained by the vendor rather than having to continually to invest with agency resources for these big upgrades every two or three years uh, is, provides cost savings along the way as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Walsh, from GAO's perspective, what are the advantages or disadvantages of relying on the Technology Modernization Fund or Working Capital Funds to resource IT modernization rather than requesting funding through the annual budget requests? So as the other witnesses have noted, the TMF allows agencies to kind of shortcut the budget cycle. Now, it is still a loan. It's yeah. not just a free gift to go out and spend willy-nilly. It has to be you know, you go through the application process, and I'll also note that the, the process as described, you know, going through TMF that, that Max talked about is very similar to having the modernization plans that we, we described. you got to have some idea of the work to be done, the timelines, and a plan to turn off the old system. Uh, the disadvantage to the TMF is that it is linked to spending and cost savings. There are times where we need to modernize systems, and they will not save money. The, the OPM breach that we talked about earlier, yeah. the government had the choice 
to modernize those networks and systems to allow the data be, to be encrypted when it was at rest. It was a trade-off. You know, if, if o, I'm sure if OPM wanted to go back in time and had that decision to make, they would absolutely spend the money to, to modernize that. But they wouldn't save any money by doing that modernization. So modernization is not just about cost savings. It's about better services to our citizens, yeah. privacy, security. Cost savings can be a part of it, but there's a lot more to this decision than just, just the money. Well, thank you. Um, look, that concludes the rounds of questions I had. I'm going to ask you all one wrap-up question um, and just double-check with staff. We're good on other senators, right? Okay. So, um, first of all, all four of you have been so generous, not only with your time this morning um, and your preparation for this hearing, uh, but with your expertise and um, your clear um, engagement with this issue and desire to help the federal government uh, do its work much better and modernize in the IT sector at a time when we so desperately need to do that uh, for all the reasons I think among others that the pandemic has really laid clear. So thank you uh, for your service, for your expertise, and for your testimony today. As we wrap up, I'm going to ask each of you this, and I'll start with Ms. Wynn. Could each of you describe what, in your opinion, is the greatest challenge presented by the sustained use of legacy IT systems. If you already feel like you've talked about it, just go ahead and say that. But I really don't want to let this opportunity go without just giving you all a chance to focus on that. And Ms. Wynn, we'll start with you. Great. Thank you. And thank you again for the honor to testify today. It's, it's a great pleasure of mine to continue to give to the United States federal government after 30 years of service. So I would say the greatest challenge presented to us today are agency and department cultures. They must recognize that IT modernization is part of the path forward for the United States government to quickly and securely deliver new or better quality services to the American public. And this needs to be done in, with a positive customer experience. And finally, it must be delivered in a way that improves national security and not poke a hole through it. Again, it was an honor to be here and to be with my former colleagues as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Um, Mr. Everett. I would say, I think, I, I hope that we've covered it well for you. I think I, I would summarize simply saying missed opportunities. To me, this challenge is we're, we're missing uh, opportunities across the board, opportunities to secure our systems, opportunities to entice uh, people with new and innovative skills into government, opportunities to serve uh, the citizens of the country. Um, all of those are sort of these, they're these missed opportunities over and over again uh, that we, we're just stuck in these systems, right? And again, that's that word I use, technical debt, but that's what it means is it's not just the money. It's, every, it's as Renee said, it's the culture. It's so many of these things that we're missing out on, these missed opportunities that we could get simply by doing some basic, you know, basic modernization of systems. The flow down effect would be, uh, really, I think, dramatic in just so many different areas. Um, and so that that's the part that disappoints me. But right now, it also excites me because we've got new resources. We've got the attention of Congress and other folks. Um, we've got some really good new opportunities right now. And everyone has seen the value that IT can bring to, uh, to life and to meeting challenges just after this last year of dealing with COVID. Um, there's so many things we were able to do because of technology. Um, I think there's a, a unique time of recognition of that. And so um, I, I would love to see that progress, not not pause, but accelerate um, in 2021. Thank you. Ms. Coleman? Chair Hassan, I think it's a mark of how aligned we all are that when you asked this question, I wrote down culture change and missed opportunities, just like Renee and Max. And I think that uh, just to double down on that statement, modern Modern technology allows us to do things not just better, but things we couldn't do before. Right. And I think that's the missed opportunity if we don't modernize. And I'll, I'll give you one very quick example. Uh, the pandemic has illustrated so many areas where government is so critical to the well-being of the public. Uh, in New Mexico, unemployment claims spiked by 600% when people were thrust out of work and call center workers were sent home. And they weren't able to process claims in a timely way. Uh, we had the opportunity to help them with a virtual contact center, which allowed their workers to work from home, but also with chatbots that let them answer questions um, in an automated fashion and take some of that 
uh, burden off of the call center agents to focus on the higher value need and get economic relief into the community quickly. So there's, there are things that can be done that we're just not taking advantage of at every level of government. And I think that it, the time is now to rethink that. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Walsh. It's hard to imagine a government function that isn't somehow tied to IT. Okay. Uh, as we go along, IT has become more and more complex. If you look back again to the Voyager probes, those were written with 3,000 lines of COBOL code. We've come a long way since then. Modern technology requires millions, if not billions, of lines of code. The problem is, the longer we wait to modernize, the longer we procrastinate, the more it's going to cost, both in terms of money, in terms of breaches, in terms of security, in terms of lost, to quote my, my peers, lost opportunities, ways that we could have better served our citizens. So it's, it's, it's an issue of procrastination. We need to act. We need to act now. Well, thank you. Thank you to all four of you uh, for your time and your testimony this afternoon. Uh, to Kevin Walsh, Casey Coleman, Renee Wynn, and Max Everett, uh, your testimony provided really valuable insights on this topic and your contributions to improving federal IT systems in a fiscally responsible way um, are just really, really appreciated. As I mentioned in my opening statement, this hearing is just the first on the costs and challenges presented by reliance on legacy IT systems, and I look forward to continuing this important oversight work to save taxpayer dollars, to deliver government services more efficiently, and to keep government IT systems secure. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on May 12th for submissions of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is now adjourned.